I hope that we will have the time to see the two games that I've prepared. We'll definitely see the first one, but I'll go relatively fast so we'll have time for the other. The first one is from the 1927 World Championship, and it's a game between Jose Raul Capablanca and Alexander Aljochin. I'm not going to say Alekhine, sorry, but you know who it is. And um, it's always impressive to see one of the former world champions lose in a way that he loses in this game, especially someone like Capablanca, who is extremely talented. And um, the funny thing is that uh, I got this game somewhere else, and then I looked for it on Chessbase, and the, commentate, the comments on Chessbase uh, actually uh, borrow a lot of the ideas that were analyzed after the game, both by Aljokin and uh, comments by other masters of the past. Now with the benefit of having great chess computers like Stockfish 7, for example, you see how their comments and insights are so off. It's really amazing. It's like they'll attach a question mark to a move and the computer says, best choice. Or they'll say, this is a great move and the computer says, nah, maybe third choice. And this is after you let it churn for a while. It's just really impressive how strong they have become. So our first game is again, as promised, Capablanca Aljochen. So d4, d5, again, a classical treatment of the d4 opening. c4, e6, knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5, knight bd7. OK, not the most flexible move, but definitely uh, one of the main lines, e3. I really hope I don't have to discuss at greater length because this is kind of painful for me. What happened if you tried to win the pawn on d5? Some of you who might know the trap are already smiling. I can tell you that I was in a world championship and one of my students in the world championship fell into this trap. I don't know who was, who was more sad, she or I, but there were tears. The point, of course, just without moving the pieces, for those who don't know, pawn takes, pawn takes, knight takes. Looks like a great move because it wins a pawn, right? The knight is pinned. Well, that's the difference between an absolute pin and a relative pin, because here you can just take the knight, and after bishop d8, bishop to b4 check, the queen is coming back with interest. So you can see that after queen here, takes, take, and I take the bishop, white ended up just being a piece down. You just lose a piece from this, so not very advisable. Well, of course, someone like Capablanca is not, not interested in that kind of junk. So bishop e7, OK. Knight f3, I'm not going to discuss the opening at great length because, again, 1927, so many things were different. Castles, rook to c1. Again, there's a tiny bit of a battle here about the captures on, d4, on uh, c4. Um, white is reluctant to move his bishop to e2 or d3 because of pawn takes pawn on c4. The bishop will have to move again and recapture, and then potentially knight d5, you know, at some moment. So. He is trying to play useful moves without committing his bishop. If black will take now on c4, the bishop will, will capture in one move, recapture in one move. So a6, again, a very interesting treatment of the position. Other ideas to try to play for like h6 and b6 and stuff like that. And um, very normal. But here, of course, the idea is very similar to some ideas from the Queen's Gambit accepted or some of the Slavs. He wants to be able to take on c4. And then to play the move b5 and bishop b7 and develop that problem child, this bishop on c8 is always a problematic piece in the queen's gambit except a uh, queen gambit declined. So um, again, there are several possibilities. a3 was played in the game, c5. Normally c5 is a move that we really roll our eyes at. But once the pawn has moved from a6, it's not such an outrageous move. Normally, of course, b6 is played. And then immediately, if b4, then a5, just excellent position for black. Now that the pawn has already moved, after b6, I can just take it. And again, I'm first on the c file. So this move is not without some value. Of course, black can just play a move like c6. So something like this, just, and you know, b4, a5, something like this can happen. Very normal. OK, so in our game, a3 was played. Once again, white is not moving his bishop from f1 because he's expecting a pawn capture on c4. So h6, again, a very standard move, kind of asking the bishop where he wants to go. Um, first of all, it's an escape throw for the king in the very, very, very long run. But also, in many lines, if this knight wants to move with the idea of reducing the, the pressure of the pin, when the bishop is here, sometimes you can just slide to f4 
and just not trade for the bishop on e7, saying my bishop is better than this bishop. When h6, bishop h4 is played, especially when this knight ends up going to e4 or h5, then bishop g3 is not so easy to make because the knight will capture it, and black is assured that a trade of bishops will happen. So in any event, h6 makes a lot of sense, bishop h4, and he took. Good choice. He understands that you know, he cannot play any useful moves himself. He kind of ran out of moves that he wants to make. What he really wants to do is to develop his bishop on c8. So he says, okay, I'm not going to wait for you to develop your bishop, so let's do it. And b5. Now Capablanca had to make a decision on which diagonal he wishes to keep the bishop. He played bishop e2, but I'm thinking that another interesting move would have been to play bishop a2, maintaining him on the a2, g8 diagonal, which increases his control over the, um, the d5 square. Definitely has some value. You see that in this game, Capablanca, of course, is trying to play for a win, as we call it, because he has million, a million ways to make a draw, but he's trying to be ambitious. Of course, in the, uh, maybe at the end of the game, when he shook hands and resigned, maybe he regretted it. <laughs> so bishop e2, bishop to b7. Yeah, I should make a note here that two moves are on the agenda, bishop b7 and c5. Both are very principled. The question is what move, or, what, what move order to choose. The way as it happened in the game, it didn't make any difference because white didn't try to, to stop the move c5. But the point is that when black plays bishop b7, as we will see, it gives white the added choice of playing the move b2, b4, trying to, to never allow c5 from being played. Um, well, we will see what, 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 what I mean. Um, he could play c5 immediately as well. Wouldn't make any, any difference. So, but bishop b7. He's basically inviting b4, and you'll see that after b4, a5, of course, the principled reply. And again, there are many, many crazy lines. If knight takes b5, then c6, and when the knight withdraws, we just win the pawn on b4. That cannot be good for white. Rook b1 is possible, trying to defend the pawn. But then again, black is going to play knight d5 and release himself from the pin. So the question is, sure, you stop c5, but what have you gained? I mean, you gave yourself a very weak pawn on b4. Maybe this is not very advisable. So, and queen b3, again, take on b4. Black is doing okay. The long story short, he decided to just ignore it, and he castled. And the game goes down that path. c5. And pawn takes c5. Again, I have to tell you, this position that, again, kind of resembles positions from the queen's gambit accepted, actually where you take on c4, and eventually the bishop regains the pawn, you can play a6 and b5. It's very much similar to that, although most of the time the bishop is not really on h4 in that position. So takes, takes, and in this position he played knight d4. The commentator was saying that maybe in this position he should have just resigned himself to the fact that he doesn't have much, and played to get equality, meaning trade queens, takes, takes and rook fd1. I think that if this would have happened, like I like to say in my lectures, we would never see this game. Because they would probably agree to a draw within, I don't know, x number of moves. Be, it's very hard to believe that anybody can lose this position, white or black. So, but of course, right now, Capablanca is completely unconcerned, and he just wants to play. And, and the move he played is not a bad one, by the way, bishop d4. That's fine. I mean, knight d4. OK, so. Rook c8, again, very logical. The game continues, the game itself, you see that it, it plays and continues in, on very, very sensible grounds. Right now, okay, each had their declaration of the center. The center got dissolved. All minor pieces are out for both sides. Both sides castled, almost like a classical treatment of the position. So time to bring the rook into the game. There's an open file. Let's fight for it. And now white played the move b4. Now, intuitively, when I saw this move, I saw it without commentary. I didn't see any notes. And immediately something struck me as, this move just makes no sense to me because, yeah, you kick the knight from c5, but you relinquish the c4 square forever, and you make the c file a little softer from your point of view because the knight on c3 doesn't have its natural b2 support. So I'm very, very surprised at this. Okay, the commentators say that bishop f3 
And then queen e2 with the idea of rook fd1 is a very solid plan. So after bishop f3, black can play the move queen b6. Very sensible, developing the queen and clearing d8 for his rook. So queen e2, rook fd8, rook fd1. Again, probably the game would have gone into a path that would lead, us, would lead to oblivion because we would never see it. It would just not be exciting enough to show. But Capablanca decides to try for b4. Very interesting. Knight d7. Again, black is saying, I'm not interested in going to e4 where there's going to be some mass exchanges. Let me try to keep my pieces. I'm thinking to myself, if I want to do something on the c4 square, which piece is going to serve best there? Most likely it'll be a knight, if I can get it there without much consequences. So I want to go knight d7, knight b6, and knight c4. This is my plan. So he preserves the knight like so. OK. Again, in this position, we can see that the, the move is given a question mark, if you can see it on the board. But this is the commentator's question mark. When you put this position in one of the, one of the modern computers, one of the engines, for example, I use Stockfish 7. After a long time of churning, he had absolutely nothing against this move. Claiming that this is not, you will see in a second what was the real mistake. That was, there's definitely a consensus there. But bishop g3 in itself doesn't cause much damage. Maybe bishop f3 would again been more logical, because by playing bishop f3, you enable knight e4 in some positions, especially if the queen moves from d8. And then it just makes a draw just simpler to achieve. You just kind of force your way into an equal position. And this move doesn't. But that's not, that's not enough to call it a bad move. So knight b6 is promised. The knight is clearing this, the, the road to go to c4. And again, knight b3 got better reviews. Queen b3 got a little frown. But that's, again, so far white hasn't done anything to say that he is in trouble. Of course, the problem is that he has nothing to play for. And now he just has to make sure that he's equalizing. But he is still within the realm of life is good. So knight d5, bishop f3, rook c4. Again, you will see that this move gets an exclamation mark, but not according to the computer. I mean, the commentators thought that that was a great move, but the computer says, yeah, knight c4 just as good. Nothing really, no problem with it. So rook c4. And uh, right, here's a variation. I forgot about this line for some reason. Bishop e2 takes, 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 queen d7. And rook c8 is coming very quickly. And of course, only black can claim any happiness in this position. White has just nothing to sell, so to speak, in that position. So he did not play bishop e2. He played knight e4 queen to c8. And again, a disagreement between the, the commentators and the computer. They attach this move a mistake, as a mistake. Well, it's fair to say that the computer doesn't think it's his first choice, doesn't think it's the best move. But he would not give it a question mark. It's one of the moves that he's suggesting. He's saying that that's you know, an optional move. It doesn't really destroy the evaluation of the position. Um, he does agree that a move like, let's say, queen b1. Oops, sorry is a lot more prudent. Because now here, and then knight d2, forcing the issue, asking the rook what he's going to do, takes, takes, queen a8, with a more or less dynamically balanced position. Again, probably I would prefer to be black if I was asked. But because again, bishop g3 and the other bishops are not really, not really doing much. But it's not, it's not very likely that one side will win this game. However. After takes, knight takes, rook c1, queen a8. And now came the move. Of course, we can see that the comments are that um, he wants to play a move like, let's say, knight c3 or knight takes b4 because of the domination in the diagonal. So especially knight takes b4. So he played the move knight c3. Now this move, the commentators gives absolutely no comment. But that's a question mark. That's a mistake for sure. That the computer has no, it's completely consensus among all the, the analysis engines that knight c3 was the big mistake. The commentator make this move, and this is, this is what should have been done. Knight c5, he should have gone for it. And after takes, takes, rook c8. Um, 
I'm trying to hear all the comments that they give are big. They say bishop e2 is equal. Maybe even bishop e2, but I, I think a4 is the move that the computer wants to play here. Like this. And okay, they say knight a5, big advantage for black. That's, that's not accurate. Here there's enough compensation, there's enough, uh, enough play, and the weakness of this pawn where white is generating a lot of play, a lot of counterplay, and he is, again, maybe a little worse, but I don't think he should lose the game. Yeah, the pawn is gone, but I'm going to go a4 and I'm going to soften the queen side. And it's going to be very hard to defend this pawn because this is not a natural place for the rook. Okay. You know, the rook w doesn't want to stay here forever. I can always try to chase it by moving my queen away and playing knight b3 if I need to. And this, again, now the two bishops, even if you take this pawn, it's just not enough. It's, it's, it's an advantage for black, but not, not a big one. In the game, you'll see what happens. And if you take an imprint of this in here, maybe... After a4, like I said, black has some, some advantage, but it's kind of tenable from white's point of view. You'll see what happens, what he did. He did this, a move that gets nothing from the commentators. And I was really amazed because this really, really, really gives um, black a big advantage. So, rook c8. Okay, already he has ideas to play the move knight d2. And white is going to be really hurting. His c3 knight is going to need babysitting. His bishop on f3 is going to need babysitting. So he decides to take. I don't know what else to suggest. I think it's reasonable. Takes, takes, and takes. And again, it's easy to see that while the knight on c4 is completely implanted in the white area, the knight on d4 can be, can be easily harassed, namely by bishop f6, like we see in the game. So he did the move a4, a move that Aljokin says is decisive from black's point of view. Well, it's true that black already has a big advantage, so whatever white does is going to have a big advantage. But the computer thinks that a4 is probably just one of the normal moves. Not necessarily worse than h3 that was recommended by the annotators. So a4. And bishop f6. Very, very good. He just wants to take the knight on d4, which will do two things. One completely accentuate the strength of the knight on c4 compared to the bishop on g3, which looks a little bit like shooting in the air. It's like a very beautiful diagonal. If we could add more, more squares here, something like a9 and minus a10 or something, it will still shoot at nothing. It does nothing. And our knight is very, very annoying. But again, it'll take some technique to do, uh, to do something about it. Here he decides to play the move rook to d1, uh, knight f3, excuse me. If rook to d1, oh, this is another funny thing I have to show you. Rook d1, and then the annotators go into this immediate, amazing uh, lecture about how this is a strong move, and after queen takes, knight b6 is a strong move. Okay, I just don't understand why you cannot play this move and just be up a pawn and win the position easily. This is just very, very strong in this position. So notice that there's always a mate in the back rank. So, I don't know. Very, very strange. So, uh, oops. We had bishop f6, and we had knight f3, bishop to b2. The idea is I want to play the move e5, and then possibly e4, harassing the knight on f3. But I don't want to do it with my bishop being locked. I want to first get my bishop into activity, and then after a certain move, I will uh, play e5. Okay, there's a million variations again of what happens after rook d1, and again rook d1, knight e3, uh, all kinds of things. But again, I want to be able to show you the second game, so I'm going to speed up just a tiny, tiny bit. He played rook e1, not a big difference for the other variations. Rook to d8, complete control. Again, the c file that was white's main achievement, black's main achievement, is now completely locked, and he just moves away to the d file. He has better minor pieces, he controls the file. Of course, we can say that black has a very, very significant advantage. Pawn takes, pawn takes, pawn h3. Again, he is absent of doing something productive. He needs to play moves like this, but that's not a bad move. Again, always uh, making sure that the king is not going to be trapped on the first rank. e5, very, very good. Black continues with his plan. Um, after e4, in this position, then just queen d3. 
Again, very, very nice. The pawn on b4, I mean, you can see that endings like this, after the trade of queens, again, you can see that both e4 and b4 are extremely weak pawns, while conversely, the pawn on e5 can be defended further with f6, and I can play rook b3, take the pawn on b4, live to tell. So he did rook to b1, trying to harass the bishop, pawn e4, attacking the knight, and in this position, he had to have played one of the sad moves, either knight h2 or knight e1, but of course on either one of them there's going to be a penetration with the queen. So for example, after knight e1, queen d2, it's just very strong. Look at the space advantage, better pawn structure, better minor pieces, better rook. I mean, in the long run it looks hard to defend. In the game, he was in real time trouble, it's move 31, and Capablanca was in real time trouble. He played knight d4, and this move should just lose a pawn, but the way he played it, he just lost the game immediately, but that was, probably he did himself a favor because no way that someone like Aljochen would not win a position like this. So after bishop takes, of course, after pawn takes, queen takes, just up a pawn with a better minor piece, he planned to play this in time trouble, and he thought, well, I'm going to regain my piece and I'm going to be able to fight back. He is almost right. I mean, if not for the next move, this would have been a fantastic resource. However, he just played here and resigned. He loses everything. So, for example, after queen d5, rook d5, pawn takes, check. It's just hopeless. Or alternatively, um, after this, takes. Again, if you try to take on d4, Rook takes, pawn takes, rook takes. Again, a position with no, no hope whatsoever, of course, total, totally winning. So, kind of a masterpiece by Aljochen, I think. Very, very nice. It's not every time, it's not every day that we see Capablanca demolished like this, especially in the middle game and toward the late middle game and the end game. Pretty impressive. Any questions about the game? If you want to write down what it was, it was again Capablanca, Aljochen, 1927. Okay, so we will go on to the next game. Our next game is a little more modern. This comes from the 1966 World Championship between Spassky and Petrosian. And uh, this was one of Petrosian's better games, I think. Again, we know that anybody who followed Petrosian's games know that he was a very strong defender. A very strong defender. And one of his big fortes was exchange sacrifices. He was very famous for sacrificing exchanges. And this game is one of them. Very, very nice. So, without further ado, d4, knight f6, knight f3, e6 is going to be a Torre attack. Bishop to g5, d5, knight d2, bishop to e7, e3, knight d7, bishop d3. So far I'm going relatively fast because this has been more or less normal. C5, C3, B6, castles here, and he plays knight E5. Okay, of course the other plan in this position is to play A4 with the idea of playing A5 and try to get some activity on the queen side. But he plays for this. Now it's time for black to be a little bit on the alert. If I'm going to get to play the move F4 or rather queen f3, queen h3, and then at the right time start advancing my f-pawn, that could be painful. So notice that in this position, Petrosian does not castle, which is, in my opinion, very accurate not to castle. So he takes right now, forces him to take with the d-pawn, knight to d7. And if you remember the comment that I made on queen-pawn openings before, I said that sometimes when the knight moves and the bishop is here and not here, he doesn't have to trade and he can just go to f4 and preserve itself. Well, he does it here, except that, again, every position is very independent. And here, bishop f4 might not be the best idea. Maybe bishop e7 would have been uh, a little more to the, in the spirit of the position. So, bishop f4. And, okay, already both the commentators and the, the, the computer agree on the move that should have been played except they give it dubious and the computer says good move. So g5, here, h5, that should have been played. That's, I, I don't know what, what the commentators were thinking, but that's a good line. 
one of the reasons why the bishop should not come to f4. So he played queen c7. And in this position, knight f3 was played. And they mentioned the move queen g4 with g5 as a very, very bad idea from white's point of view. But probably the best move is a move that was not even mentioned. And that is queen h5. That is probably the most challenging um, move in the position. Notice the g6, queen h6. You cannot take here because queen g7. And this move is, is maintaining the balance of the game. Defending e5 for now. And even if later I have to play knight f3, at least my queen is kind of nagging in enemy territory. He chose to play knight f3. h6. Again, a move that deserves no introduction. He wants to play g5 without losing the pawn, without having to mess up things. b4. Looking for his chances on the other wing. g5. Bishop g3. Of course, he's really hoping that he will take on b4, allowing, giving him the d4 square for the knight, and then maybe knight b5. Uh, the rook is going to come to c1. So, of course, this is a very nice hope, but, you know, not going to happen. h5. Once again, we see that the threat is very simple. I just want to play h4, trapping the bishop. So you have to play here. And takes, very, very strong. The best move, again, you want to open files. You'll see what he did during the game, how he used that open g file. And in this position, he went back bishop to f4. And again, look at the comment above. If you try to regain the pawn by playing here, then first things first, I'm going to close things up on the queen side by taking a tempo over the bishop. When the bishop moves, bishop will take the knight, and your center pawn is mine. Of course, this is just great for black. I have an extra pawn. I'm attacking the pawn on c3, which is not so easy to defend. And white really has nothing to show for it at all. No attack, no initiative, nothing. He has a beautiful d4 square, but what piece is he exactly going to is going to put there exactly? He would rather have a knight. If I could have a knight instead of this bishop and put it here, I will give you that pawn any time of the day. But that's not, not possible. So bishop f4 was played. And black castles here. Now Spassky played a move that really amazed me. Because when I'm looking at this position, I'm thinking to myself, well, you have a great chance right here, right now, to open up things by playing b takes c5. You know, something is going to open up. Do it. But he doesn't do it. He goes a4. And in my opinion, that's not a very smart move. For better or for worse, he should have taken here. And now black has several choices. If you take with a piece, you give me the d4 square for my knight. That's a huge asset. That's a tremendous asset for me. That knight is very strong, and it can still hop to places like b5, and then maybe d6. It's very dangerous. If you take with the pawn, then after rook b1, I definitely have some chances. I have an open b file. Look at this position, keep, an, again, a mental picture of it, and then compare it to what happened in the game. It's, it's uncomparable to me. So what he did was he played a4. Maybe he thought that black has no good way to change the structure, and he is now threatening a5 on top of everything else, and will always have a takes b6 as a tempo whenever he needs it. But look what he did, c4. Again, an anti-positional move completely. But he assessed correctly that it's worthwhile giving him the d4 square just to close the queen side completely from any possible attacks. Because the initiative on the king side, thanks to that open g file, is going to completely outweigh the knight on d4. A very intelligent decision. But you will see that it involves an investment, later an investment of material. So, OK. Well, bishop f5 was mentioned as a possibility, but again, hard to take it too seriously. Bishop e2, a6. The key move in the combination, you must be able to lock the, 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 the queen side. Now, if b5, a5, and if a5, b5. So there's no more chance for white to attack. At some point, when you will go here, I'll close this way or this way. doesn't really matter. Whether you push it or not, or you leave it like this or not, it's just of no consequence. Everything is closed here. But white has one thing to show for all this. That's the knight on d4. Not enough, Petrosian says. So first of all, king h1. Sooner or later, you have to move the king. Rook to g8. We can see already that the move order is just not very important. Rook to g1. 
Again, maximum defense, rook g4. And now, of course, if you play knight h2 or something like this, then rook g6. If the knight goes back, I'm just going to be able to double on the g-file for free. So, queen d2. If you ask what about knight to d4, it, the answer is coming. It's the move order again doesn't matter. It's going to happen very soon. So, rook here and a5, b5. But you leave it like this or, or play b5 or whatever. That's the same on the queen side. Rook d1. Bishop f8. Knight h2. Well, Black's idea, of course, is to play the move bishop g7 at some moment and just put overwhelming pressure against this pawn. So, knight h2. On knight d4, I think something very similar would have been played. He simply takes the pawn on e5. Doesn't even bother to move that rook from g4. A very aesthetic and very correct passive exchange sacrifice. So he takes the pawn, knight takes, pawn takes. Let's stop for a moment and take stock of the situation. Black lost a minimal amount of material. What did he get for it? A centralized knight, a very strong mass of pawns, starting all the way from H all the way to A. You notice that black hasn't lost a pawn. He is missing a rook and he's missing a minor piece that were traded and one was sacrificed, but the pawns are all intact. So, e4. Well, this is a bit of a nervous, nervous move by Spassky, based on a tactical trick. Maybe it would have been smarter to leave the pawn here, but I think that he already realized that he is in, in sitting and waiting mode. Black is going to play bishop d6 to unpin his knight, after which that knight is going to be threatening to go to all kinds of places. And again, at the right time, pawns are going to be advancing in every direction. Of course, once the knight will move, once the bishop is here, the knight moves e5, f5, all those pawns are going to advance. And white has nothing to attack. He's up in exchange, but look where his rooks are. Rooks would really love to have open files, but they don't have them. So, he tries this. Of course, it's a little cheapo. If you play pawn takes pawn out of greed, bishop takes knight is very embarrassing. Because you notice that there's a mate on d8. So, well, of course he wasn't impressed. Continues with his plan. Bishop to d6. Very, very wise. Queen e3. And if g3, then f3. Okay, that's just a note. Knight d7. Very Petrosian-like. Very, very patient. Takes. Takes. And now white had a once-in-a-lifetime chance to try for something. Here he played the move rook to d4. That's just not going to cut it. This is totally inviting black to play what he played in the game. The best move would have been to play the move f4. And now we have a dilemma. On one hand, we don't want to take because that's just ruined our kingside pawns and opens up the file on the g file where we know that white has two rooks, black has one. And on the other hand, once you play f5, then e5. Queen c7, okay. That would have been probably the hardest for black to, to break. Black would probably have to do something like knight here, knight here, and try to play for d4 at some moment, and you know, h3 and the bishop on the long diagonal. Only black has counterplay, only black can play here, but white is still stubborn. Maybe, for example, we can put a rook on d4 and just sack it if we need to. Instead, well, what he did was just not very good. He played rook d4, e5. Immediately. And maybe Spassky thought that this is a good provocation, that he advances the pawns, managed the, but you'll see that that was a very bad decision. To the point that both the computer and Newman suggest rook takes d5 here. But clearly this is a bankruptcy of the strategy by white. If you have to take with the rook here, bishop takes, pawn takes, and then something like f5, well, who would you want to be in that position? I know that I would love to be black. So, of course, Spassky is trying to preserve everything by playing here. But now came another bolt out of the blue. F5. Fantastic. Just extremely strong play by Petrosian. He's just sending all his infantry on the white army. So, well, what to do? If you take... Well, let me show the, the variation because it's important. On this comes this. And notice that now you cannot even dream about touching your g-pawn because d4 check is going to kill you. 
and I'm about to go D4, and I'm about to go H takes G and D4, and you can see that the, the white position just completely falls apart. This position is just bankrupt. So that is this, this Greek gift on F5 is out. Um, another alternative, oh, they mentioned it also after E takes F5, if, uh, Knight F6 is also very strong. So he took on D5. I mean, otherwise I will just play F4, or I'll take on E4, just to keep taking stuff. So he took here. F4, and he played queen a4. If queen a7, the e4 pawn is going to keep advancing, and black is going to have four pawns on the king side on the fourth rank, on his fifth rank. So he tries this, knight f6, queen f5, king b8. Again, a very picturesque position. It's one of those positions where yeah, you have an extra exchange, you have an extra rook, so to speak, on the board for a minor piece, but while the rooks have no access, no lines of action, the minor pieces are terrorizing your position. So, again, what to do? After queen e6, he would just trade, trade, and this, attacking the rook and the pawn on f2. What a discouraging position to have as white, just depressing, really depressing. And alternatively, he played f3, Bishop c8, queen had to go all the way back, g3. Again, you can imagine that this is not really closing because h3 is coming very, very shortly and there's nothing to do to stop it. So, rook e1, h3. After pawn takes g2 and queen here, followed by queen takes h3 and something coming on the h-file. Horrible. Horrible. So no, so he played bishop f1, rook h8. It's coming, winter is coming. So takes, takes. Um, in the game he played king g1. After bishop takes, not rook takes, because he wants the queen in front of the rook, and therefore this. And queen takes h3 with, well, with mate to follow. So that's not fun. He moved the king away from the line of the rook. So takes. Again, if rook takes, queen d7, and the queen comes to the h file quickly, he tries to run with the king. e4. And not a beautiful shot. Again, when you have lots of pawns, you can give some of them away in order for, to make the other ones count. So, after pawn takes f3 with a threat of rook h1 mate, it's just stopping the king from running away. He tries queen d1, knight g4, and not a beauty. He can even sack the knight just to make the pawns roll forward. And of course, the knight is threatening to go, well, where isn't he threatening to go? h2, e3, anywhere from every direction. So he took it, f3. White is up a whole rook, but yeah, good luck. So rook g2, trying to give away some material, takes and resigns. Just simply resigns after queen takes, or king g1, rook h1, simply after king takes g2, rook h2, and the queen comes to the game. Of course, the black king is in no danger because the white pieces are too far away. The black queen and rook are going to give checkmate momentarily. I think that this was really one of Petrosian's nicest games. I've seen a lot of nice games by him, but this game really, really impressed me. He is playing someone like Boris Spassky. He's not playing a class player. And he is playing like, almost like he's playing someone in a simo. Giving him material with no fear, playing very aggressively with black. And you just feel like, where was Spassky in this game? Sure, he had to make mistakes, but he makes it seem like he was never in the game. <laughs>